Hello, so I'm Ed Yong, um, and uh, I write the blog Not Exactly Rocket Science, uh, and I'm here talking with... Abby Smith, uh, and I write the blog ERV, and we're both at Science Blogs. Yeah, we are. Okay, uh, so what do you want to start talking about? I guess uh, science communication is probably a good idea since we both do it. And actually you have a book to plug, which I want to hear about. Yes, I do. I actually have it right here. I'm just going to hold it up. Hello. This is my uh, little baby. It um, came out uh, sometime last week. Um, and I'm really pleased with it. It's just a collection of about 80 or so of the best posts from my blog uh, written over the last year. Um, and it's completely self-produced and self-published uh, through an online publisher called Lulu. Cool. Um, and you you write real blog posts. Like, I think our blogging styles are both <laughs> very, very different. Um, I think my mine are kind of irrelevant, but irreverent, I think is always a better word. Um, mm. And yours... You learn things from them, and you take, uh, you know, complex scientific research that regular media outlets, um, I don't think, do a very good job of explaining to people. And I think you explain them uh, in a down to earth way that people can understand without dumbing it down. Um, like you said, not exactly yeah. ro- rocket science, but uh, not dumbing it down either. And I really like that. Uh, thank you very much. I, it, I, that's really was the idea behind it to start off with. Uh, I'm really, really keen to engage people who aren't um, uh, who aren't really knowledgeable about science or don't really have that sort of um, educational background, but um, are interested in it and want to know more about it. Um, and I think that's quite a sizable market of people who maybe aren't being catered for by normal mainstream media or not in a way that um, we were not with the sort of accuracy that we'd like. So, yeah, that that is the idea, um, hopefully, to get people who aren't uh, interested in science a bit more engaged with it. Um, and, the, I mean, this, the sort of writing style that's on the blog um, is a very... Um, uh, straightforward summary of the science that's out there but um but you, I mean, that that's really the sorry go you on. still i think you still learn things from your posts it's not one of my major problems with mainstream uh reporting of science um just recently uh there was a fellow in germany who was cured of aids he was cured of aids with a bone marrow transplant mm. and that's what the mainstream media reported and so i kept getting all these emails from people wanting to know more about it like to actually explain the science behind what happened and was he really cured? Like, what, what? what's the science behind it? What happened? And the mainstream mm. media doesn't tell you that. They just say, this guy was cured, cured from AIDS. So um, yeah. I think your posts go beyond that, just reporting the science, but actually um, reporting it in such a way that the general public actually learns something from it. Yeah, and um, I, I mean, I've written this in the introduction to my book, actually, but... Um, one of the uh, problems I have with uh, traditional science journalism, or at least a lot of it, is that um, it, you know, it, it's obviously quite sensationalised. They do to make the stories entertaining, but they do so at the expense of a lot of the detail in the story Absolutely. and um, a lot of the um, a, a lot of the stuff that makes science science. So you don't get um, details about the sort of controls that are, that are done or the um, context in which the um, new studies are, um, are, are find themselves in. So you don't get any um, information about the background to the work. Um, it's all about the, the implications. It's all looking to the future, whereas I really like to look at the results themselves because I think those are the interesting things. And I think Absolutely. if you can't build a really interesting story from that, then you're not really doing your job that well. Um, so, so, I mean, that's the, the point of um, the writing style which I've chosen to adopt, which is just to really um, make the science the, um, the centre of the piece, yes. rather than sort of going beyond that and, and you know, um, dumbing it down or actually making it inaccurate. Well, where I find myself as an HIV researcher is, especially recently on my blog, I, I've been calling myself Debbie Downer because, <laughs> yeah. because the media keeps saying, oh, we have all these great breakthroughs, all these great breakthroughs, oh, we're going to have a cure for AIDS tomorrow. And I have to be, go in and be like, well, not really. It's really cool science. It's still really good science, but it's mm. not a cure for AIDS yet. Um and so I, I just always feel like I have to be the downer to tone down uh, what mainstream media is hyping about science. 
Mm, absolutely, and and um, that sounds very familiar to me because I I work in um, Cancer Research UK, so um, I uh, am sort of part of the public face of the organisation. Uh, I do a lot of media work, so I uh, talk to journalists a lot, sort of straddle every side of that fence, really. And um, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the time, we have to do play a very similar similar role. We have to really play down a lot of the enthusiasm and interest and you know people call us up and say is this a new breakthrough is this one step closer to a cure and we you know we sort of have to say well kind of but but a very far you know long way down the road it's exciting but it's exciting in itself rather than because um a million lives are going to be saved tomorrow and it's really nice like you said to just appreciate the science as the science and not not as the hype um, mm. and I think like you, you have a PhD, right? Uh, I don't actually, I, I am a failed PhD oh, student. Wow. I started doing, I started doing a graduate, uh, a graduate degree and it just really, really didn't work. I can't begin to explain the many ways in which I sucked at lab research. But um, but after about uh, a year or so, I basically worked out that I was much, much better at talking about science than actually doing it. So I um, started going for science communication jobs and um, got one after about two years. So I basically downgraded from a, a PhD to a master's um, and started working at Cancer Research UK's um, communication department. But you don't have a degree in journalism, though, right? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I... All I have in that area is um, is that I went to a course on science communication um, when I was a graduate student run by Cancer Research UK, and it was really good. It really um, inspired me and taught me that um, this was a good idea to uh, focus in this area and try and make a career out of it. Um, I don't have any real journalism training, but... Um, I have interviewed people before in a freelance capacity, and I have had media training as part of my work. And I would actually really, really recommend um, scientists who find themselves having to talk to the media about their work to, to get some training, because actually um, it's it's quite an interesting skill set. It's not as obvious as people think, and to really, really do it well, I think you do need a bit of training. Um. Well, I, I absolutely agree because uh, what I was what I was getting at is that scientists themselves, I think, should be the communicators to the public. Um, mm. Because what I'm thinking when I'm writing is that you know I can go through the time to explain the science um, in such a way I think everyone can understand myself, or I can do that through a journalist who will ultimately write an article that I might not agree with on a scientific level. Um, Mm. So really, from my point of view, scientific communication is just, you know, we don't really need to have degrees in journalism. Of course, I I agree that training would be uh, an asset, but, you know, you don't have to have a degree in journalism to do what we do to, to communicate science to people. No, no, you don't. Um, I I think that, um, so what, what I would say is if you, if you get um, interviewed by a journalist about your work, um, they will usually have in mind a sort of story that they want to pursue or an angle that they want to, to go down. Yes. And I think the mistake that um, a lot of people make when talking to journalists is to assume that the point of an interview is to answer all their questions. And really, the point of the interview, as far as you're concerned, is to get your story across. Now, if that story is different from the one they want to write about, then you've got a bit of a job on your hands because you've got to really try and sell what your angle. But I think people need to think about that beforehand. So, you know, we've talked about um, uh, uh, journalists talking too much about um, practical implications and not about the science themselves. Well, I think a lot of that comes from, you know, doing a long interview and then at the end you say, so what are the practical implications of your work? You know, what, what, what could we expect many years down the line? And then the scientist says, you know, feeling obliged to answer the question, says something like, oh, well, you know, I don't know, I work in telomere research, so maybe this will be a, uh, a you know, fountain tell us a lot more about the ageing yeah. process. and Yeah, fountain of youth, exactly. We'll have a little elixir of vitality um, that will be able to sell through Amazon in about five years. So it, I think 
and and that those sorts of statements get grabbed on because yes. they're they're fantastic from the point of view of the journalist. Now, if you've not given them anything else in your interview, then you can't really blame them from taking the best bit of it and and running with that. So I think like a bit more thought beforehand and really trying to think about what the most exciting part of your work from your point of view is and how to sell it out to someone who's asking you about it. Um, I think a lot of my professors have gotten caught in that scenario, um, cure for AIDS tomorrow, fountain of youth tomorrow sort of thing. Yeah. And so from their perspective, they just don't want to talk to the media anymore. Mm. Um, and so yeah, sometimes the universities will put out press releases um, hyping research uh, that their uh, investigators have done. And really those aren't exactly all that much better um, about the, mm. the hype. No, and... Um... And I think ev- everyone suffers that way because the scientists don't want to talk to journalists anymore. Um, the uh, journalists can't get interviews with the best scientists because they're a bit, an, you know, they're sort of annoyed. The public um, are more, you know, probably much more sensible about, about these things than everyone thinks. And you know, if you look at a um, a piece of research that has false promises in it, if after reading too much of that, you start getting stung by it. Or, you know, if you read a piece of research where they haven't really gone into that much detail, then people start raising their own exceptions, which are often like covered in the paper through controls and discussion and what have you, but um, just aren't reflected in the pieces themselves. And I think, you know, that that's a real problem. It's just this sort of vicious cycle of dumbing down. I think that's another good thing about blogs is that it's interactive. And mm. if I write a post um, and I'm not clear enough on a topic, someone can just leave a comment, be like, I have no idea what you mean by CTLs. And then I can oh, no. bob right back in and be like, oh, man, you guys, I'm sorry, and explain what a cytotoxic T-cell is. Um, it's more of an interactive learning experience than just reading an article. Yeah, and do you find that you've become a better writer after it? I have never been a good writer. I am not a good okay. writer. I don't claim to be a good writer. Um, but like a better communicator? I think I've become a better communicator. Um, and not, not uh, worrying so much about certain details and knowing which details to emphasize and what to mm. just not worry about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, uh, like, because I, so I blog about a lot of different areas, yes. some of which I, I only have kind of an idea about, some of which I know quite well. But there, there really is nothing like having this absolutely vast army of bastards who are really really happy to pick you up on tiny points that you get wrong to make you take extra care at getting everything right and i think oh, yeah. it, it's i feel that i write more accurately now than i used to i feel that i'm a bit more selective about the types of papers that i cover um and it, it teaches you how to critically analyze um topics a bit better mm-hmm. just have you know summarizing and then having someone say well that's you know obviously rubbish so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I've, I think I've gotten a little too overly critical because we'll be, oh, yeah. we'll be discussing a paper in class and I'll just be ripping it apart and uh, my professors will be like, no, no, come on, there's good science in here. So um, I think, you know, part of the fun I think on blogging is ripping apart research um, that maybe the media is sens- sensationalizing and I don't mm, really think the paper mm. is very good at all. So it's so much fun just to rip it apart. But um, but I think that's gotten me in a little bit of trouble in class when my professors, there's good aspects of the paper that I'm not seeing because I'm having so much fun digging my teeth yeah. into it. Yeah, it's really, I think it's really easy to get carried away. Yeah. So I, I actually have two blogs. Um, I also blog... Uh, for Cancer Research UK and their sort of official organisational blog, which is a, it, it's focused on science and it talks about the research we fund, but it's also our chance to respond to news stories about cancer um, that we would you know only usually be, be interviewed about and get the sort of quick quote in. Now um, that's interesting because there is there are a lot of misconceptions about cancer and a lot of um, oh, yeah. strange things that make news stories. And we have to be very careful because it's obviously an organization blog, so it's representing the entire sure. charity. So sure. we can't just, you know, go nuts with it, but we have to, you know, still write in a fairly engaging way to point out issues. And we've had um, some, like, we've had a really good win with it. Um, the Daily Telegraph published um, a story um, which said, uh, Red Wine Prevents Breast Cancer. Okay, which, I think I've heard that. Uh, 
Yeah, which firstly is not true, but secondly was also sort of misrepresenting the, the paper itself that it was based on. So we wrote a report to this, um, and actually the day after, if you did a Google search for does red wine prevent breast cancer, the top result was our post which said, no, okay. red wine does not prevent breast cancer, shortly followed by the telegraphs in about second place. That was, you know, that was quite good. Took a little okay. JPEG of that. Um, and I think a problem, too, is that there's no, uh, what's the word? I'm, I don't want to say there's no responsibility, but there, when, when an article is sensationalized and then subsequently um, we point out that, no, it's not, the paper doesn't really say this, that, or the other, that doesn't make the front page of the health section of the newspaper like the original mm. story did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think... Like, I think you can be a bit... So people can be a bit overcritical of science journalism sometimes, um, but I think there are certain cases where it really, really matters to get it right. Um, and I think health-related things are one, because people really make decisions about mm -hmm. their lives based on what they read. And if you give them wrong information, they could theoretically kill themselves. Yes. And that, you know, that's really not what you want to do. So I think that, you know, especially with health and medical-based reporting... Um, there's there is a lot of responsibility there. Okay. But uh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm I... I'm pretty overly critical. I think of uh, science journalism because, like I said, I think scientists should do it, and they can do it, and they can do it in a way that's better um, than traditional media has been able to uh, to do over the years. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think. Um... I think the the problem is you. I think it, we ignore traditional media at our peril because they have such a wide readership. That's that true. You just you know you can't. But then that say, just makes me angry when I when I think about that. Yeah. No. I, I guess so. But I think they they also they're also useful for reaching a really wide audience. I mean, like even. Um, with even the most popular science blogs, you're going to have a smaller readership mm -hmm. than. Um, than say a national newspaper and you're also going to be more catering to people who are you know trying to actively find your information or have just sort of vaguely stumbled across it whereas um, a science story on a national daily will reach a huge number of people who um, really have no interest in this um, area whatsoever so I think I, I would I would argue that it's not the best tactic to ignore mainstream media completely, but really try and work with it and try and um, like what I would absolutely love to see is um, is a higher proportion of reporters working for national papers who um, are trained in science, and I think that's one of the main issues. That a lot of them are just sort of journalists who journalists first and scientists second, who've just been sort of shuffled across from a yeah. different desk and you know don't have that sort of technical expertise. Um. I, would you mind talking about uh, your scientific uh, journey a little more? Because um, as a graduate student, uh, I don't know, a lot of people think that if you don't grow up to go through grad school and then become a principal investigator and be a professor at a medical school or uh, in a graduate school, that you're somehow yeah. a failure. And I think that's, mm. that's decreasing with my generation because there aren't, a lot of jobs to, to even be a professor mm. if you wanted to. Um, and, you know, there are only so many research jobs and there's only so many industry jobs. And I think more of us graduating uh, with masters and PhDs are going to be looking for alternative careers. And you've done that successfully. Mm. Um, mm. So I'd really like to, as a student, I'd really like to hear your advice uh, for someone in my position right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, I definitely don't think it's the case that the only way to really contribute to science is to actually do it. Um, obviously, that's totally vital. But um, I, th I think for me, it was uh, I'd always sort of been interested in science. I went to uni, I did quite well in it, and I thought, you know, obviously the next step is to do research. And never really thinking about what that meant for me mm -hmm. and whether I was going to be suited at it. So. Um, I uh, some of the reasons why I didn't, it didn't quite pan out were the fact that I can't really focus my attention at such a narrow scope. I like looking at things quite broadly, and um, I'm also not that manually dexterous. So you, you don't know, have good lab just, hands. Is that the word? Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, uh, you know, and that's me being generous to myself here. So, so basically, I think, uh, you know, and I, I went to, uh, you know, I did lab internships and stuff like that. And I think it was probably clear from that point that it wasn't going to go very well. But I did think, uh, you know, I have to do this because otherwise I'm not going to be part of science. And um, actually what I found since, um, you know, stopping being a, a a, labs, a grad student and just going into the writing is that I feel much more connected with science now than I used to do um, because um, I never used to really have time to look at um, new discoveries and to uh, do, you know, do sort of reading beyond my little area um, and I'm learning a hell of a lot now which, uh, on an almost daily basis which I really love and it works for me and I think um, my, my advice is really to for people who are sort of struggling with this decision to try and work out what what you love, like if it's the thrill of discovery that you love, or it's, if it's you know actually getting your hands dirty, then then stay with it by all means. But if that doesn't, if that's not really working for you, and there are uh, you know and there are other things that might do, then consider a switch because there, um, science is is very much in the doing, but it's also in the telling. You know, it's it, if you. It's that sort of if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, doesn't make a noise. Well, if a discovery is made and absolutely no one knows anything about it, then you know I, th- I think it's it's a little bit empty. Um, so I think there are lots of different careers out there for people who aren't necessarily gifted with lab work, but really really want to continue um, being a part of science. You could go into publishing, you could go into um, writing, like I've done. Uh, you know, I think there's there's lots of different avenues. Um, one thing that I'm finding discouraging is that uh, I look at all these principal investigators around me, and some of them still do lab work, but it seems like mm. sometimes the job they do the most is like accounting and grant writing, yeah. and that's sort of like their job is really money, um, and of course, mm. really good ideas uh, to get that money, but. Um, I don't like. I really don't know what I want to do uh, in the end with my PhD. It's like, do I really want to do that, or would I rather go into mm. industry where I can keep doing the research that I love, or yeah. to go into some sort of alternative career, more teaching oriented career? Um, mm. So it's it's cool to talk to people who have done something different, and it's turned out very well for them. Yeah, I, and um, and I also find that because um, it, it's the same in the you know corporate sector. The the higher up you go, the less time you actually yeah. do spend. You, you spend doing the types of things that you went into the job in the first place to do. But um, I think that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy blogging in my spare time because um, it really gives me a chance to f- like flex my writing muscles, um, which I really enjoy. So you know, I, I think that there are ways around that. Um, if if you really love it, then you know, you'll you'll find a way, I think, and and certainly I have. It, it just means that um, I lose a little bit of free time elsewhere. At this point, I'm I'm just struggling to get through the end of my classes. Um, you know, yeah. still think long term, but right now I'm in uh, in stages or microbiology section, mm. and I'm getting my PhD in microbiology. Uh, the problem is, I never took microbiology even in undergrad <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> It was a 200 level course, and there were all these really fun, like 500 level courses. So I totally ignored it, and then I ended up in a <laughs> microbiology department. And uh, the professors are, will ask us something, you know, really basic, like 101. How many of you have uh, cultured um, a bacterial swab from your cheek or from your skin or something? The whole class raises their hand. I, I could sort of just hang my head. Everybody laughs. It's a so it's kind of like I started out in Spanish four instead of Spanish one. So I'm I'm not e- even really getting to write as much as I'd like right now. Um, but almost done with classes, and I can finally get back to some fun blogging. Did Did they take you to a sort of darkened room where they swabbed your cheek with a little, you know, like a sort of hazing type thing? No, no. See, I never got to do any of that. Well, that that so would have been an opportunity that I think should have been taken. Yeah. Just just pretend that everyone did it, but in a really really embarrassing way. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, what other projects are you working on right now? Oh uh, well, um, at the moment I'm probably trying to get some sleep. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I think now now that the books now that the books out, um, I think. 
it, it's just business as usual, really. That took an unexpected amount of time to do, just because um, the the act of having to put something like that together and do like doing things which I hadn't really thought about, like an index or writing a blurb at the back, which is really hard, by the way, because you've got to make yourself look amazing in two paragraphs while not sounding like an arrogant idiot nice. <laughs> um, so so that was probably the hardest bit of writing I've ever had to do um, but th- that and you know all the little bits and pieces actually took a fair amount of time and now it's out there and it's sort of you know sitting all real on my bookshelf um, feel quite proud of that um, and uh, for, to all the listeners out, out there please buy a copy we're in dire financial times <laughs> and it will help me and it's, it's almost Christmas. Christmas yeah exactly give one to your friends and family indoctrinate them into this into science either by making them read it or just sort of beating them over the head with it until they know stuff that's still my way too um yeah, yeah. it so is and but eventually you know my parents have stopped asking questions have gotten to the point of just like well are you enjoying school are you having fun during your research and if that answer is yes then they're happy <laughs> mm, yeah I, I think um, so. I really like your writing on the blog because it, you know it is it is very different to mine, but it's it's fantastic and it's really controversial and you know you challenge things. And I think I, I, I've been trying to think about this recently, and I think there are those sort of two very different schools of blogging. There's like there's quite retaliatory blogging where you try and take down um, false arguments and misconceptions or you know direct attacks on science that people have made. Um, and then there's sort of the expositional side of things, which is what I like to you know, keep to where you're just sort of talking about new research in um, in a fairly standard way, and I I really think that you you need a bit, you need a mix of both of those things um, because obviously science um, is under a fair bit of attack and there are a lot of misconceptions out there and those need to be dealt with because otherwise you're sticking your head in the sand. But equally, um, once you've done that, you also you know if you're defending something, you need something to defend, and I think you need to be um, telling people about things that um, that will inspire them and engage them. Um, and I, I don't mean that there needs to be a mix like in any one individual blog, but I think if you look at the, the sort of population as a whole, it's really good to get um, a lot of different voices going at it from different angles. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, so... So you work for the Cancer Institute in the UK? Um, what, yeah, Cancer Research UK. So are you um, – what exactly do you do? Do you take uh, – sort of make like press releases for the science, the science coming out of your labs? Or, or what exactly do you do? Uh, well, we – we're not a press office, so we have a press office, but I work in a slightly different area. So we've got um, – we're quite unique in that we're a very large organization. We have a massive information um, team or teams. Um, my area is specifically to do with um, prevention and early detection. So okay. we're um, – our, our team works to basically tell people how they can reduce the risk of cancer and also how they can detect it at an early stage. Um, and I, I work with a, a few people in the team um, who have, you know, very, very backgrounds, but um, our, our bit sort of provides the scientific backbone for all the communications we do. So we look at um, the literature, we um, we uh, keep an eye on new and upcoming stuff, and we just make sure that everything we say in these areas, any advice we give, is totally evidence-based um, and you know really based or really built on a foundation of sound science. Um, and that's fantastically interesting to me because I get to learn a lot. I get to um, look at a lot of papers at a fairly global level, um, and I also get to communicate the you know what we see. We're, we do a lot of writing. I've said that we you know we've got a blog. Um, we do uh, a lot of uh, interviews with journalists. So um, if Cancer Research UK is obviously a big organisation here, and we get asked a lot to comment on new stories that come out. And okay. you know it's people like me within the organisation who does that. So we do a lot of TV interviews and radio stuff. You know, it's quite exciting. It's a very varied job. Okay, cool. Um, I wish I could do something kind of like that uh, because really a lot of my blog posts are reactionary um, because I'll wake up mm. one morning and there'll be like 20 emails in my inbox about <laughs> they want to know about uh, this new research 
genetically modified cytotoxic T cells do this, that, or the other. And uh, so then I write about it just because I get all these emails and they're really interested uh, in the topic. But then, like, mm-hmm. I, did, I didn't get to hear about it first. They all, <laughs> they all heard about it first. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's neat. I'll write about that. Yeah, um, so who who are the people who write in? Who's so who's your audience? Are these like um like normal lay public yep. type people or yep. are they like other people in the field? Uh, not really other people in the field. Um other people in science, uh and then yep. just random readers who will see on MSN or Google News uh an article by mainstream media and they want to know if what they're reading in that article is real or what what's the real science behind uh what's in the article. Mm. I, and I think that's so valuable to that um, that people like that have this sort of resource that they can draw on now. That you know you can speak directly to someone who has a lot of technical knowledge and will give them like a fairly straightforward answer. Um, and I think that's one of the real strengths about blogging that you can sort of amass this legion of voices that maybe about ten years ago w- would never oh, yeah. have been heard. And I think it's a really good uh, learning tool for me um, because Mm. not only do I have to read the paper, but I need to understand what they did and the techniques behind the paper that I might not have necessarily uh, read on my own. Um, And then I have to turn around and be able to write it in such a way that everybody else can understand what the heck I'm talking about. Um, So Mm. I think with a lot of topics that um, maybe we hadn't gotten to yet in class or something like that, um, I think I've actually learned – the material better and like synthesize the material better because of blogging uh, that I wouldn't Mm. have done on my own in my own spare time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, It's just such a good training exercise. I think it really sharpens. um, Like a different way of studying, I think, that kind of integrates information from different areas. Mm -hmm. So, so um, in your, in your university, is it, uh, is it encouraged? Is it frowned upon? I mean, do you get support from your supervisors on it? Yes. Um, uh, I told PZ this last time. It's like my my rule um, from the higher ups in my university are don't do anything to ruin your career. That's really what they're most worried about because I don't say that I speak for the university and you know I'm just a student here. Um, and you know they think it's fun. They think it's cool because they're all you know, older fellows and they've got their iPod or their, their iPhones and they want to be hip and they really think it's cool that uh, they've got a student who's a blogger. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm sure I write things they don't agree with, but at the same time, mm-hmm. don't do anything to ruin your career is the only rule um, I've had passed down to me so far. Mm-hmm. And really, mm-hmm. I think uh, blogging has been excellent for my career because you know, I kind of, I write on odd topics, you know, quasi species and, uh, HIV evolution, viral evolution. Um, and the individuals who are like huge in this field have actually emailed me like book chapters they're working on or, uh, like recent papers they've published just, and they've been very encouraging. Um, mm. I, I actually haven't received any negative emails, um, from these guys. They, they really like the fact too, that, I'm taking words like quasi-species and talking about them <laughs> to the general public. Um, yeah, because yeah. Because we can, we can barely use that word with other scientists, but then maybe there's a few you know, normal people out there that know what that means. Um, and they think it's cool, too. Yeah, I think um, that's that's really interesting because I've also had um, sort of emails from scientists whose work I've written about um, saying – like, thank you, re- thank you very much for covering this in an accurate way. That's really um, surpassed what we've seen in newspapers or sort of mainstream media. So I think um, the, the people whose work gets covered are really, really behind um, blogs as a means of communication. Um, I think that you know that's really that's excellent. Um, you know, I have heard good things, but I haven't heard uh, anything from an individual whose paper I've ripped apart. On my blog, <laughs> yeah. and I believe our newest edition, uh, Isis, the scientist, uh, oh, yeah. actually, she ripped up a paper and then had the authors of that paper comment on her blog. And I think mm. I think the response was pretty snarky, uh, but her mm. article was kind of snarky, but it was, um, I think that was a really funny exchange. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, I, I don't, sorry, go on. Well, the thing was, I think... Uh, 
the authors didn't really um, have the same connection to the internet. I think sometimes as bloggers, we're a little uh, insular about our community and, you know, we make yeah. jokes and we get the jokes, but then someone coming in from the outside doesn't think they're funny at all. And uh, mm-hmm. I think that's what happened to these authors. They got a little uh, blindsided by blogging. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, it, I mean, it can be a bit insular and, uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't really, I think, I think that is a problem, but I think that your average reader would be able to just sort of skip past that stuff, um, and, and get to the me behind it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a problem that really hampers the medium in any big way. Well, I think I was just a little disappointed in the authors and that um, they didn't really critique um, ISIS's mm. issues with their paper. Um, they were yeah. kind of condescending and, well, you should have read this paper and that paper. When they had the opportunity to say, well, you know, we did take uh, your criticisms into account when we were writing and this, they, they had a science out- outreach opportunity and instead they decided to be snarky about it. Um, mm. Whereas, you know, when I've written positively um, about papers, those, those authors, have they haven't commented, but they've emailed me additional information and, like I said, book chapters and that sort of thing that they've been working on, uh, which I yeah. can turn around and give back to uh, the blogging community. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I'd really like it if uh, scientists were, again, more into blogging, like understanding what it is and understanding what blog posts really are and being able to comment um, in a way that the internet community, uh, I don't know, just just the way we jive. <laughs> yeah. If they would just stick up picture, lol pictures of themselves yes. with amusing captions yes. on, that would totally be the way forward. <laughs> oh, I love those in immunology. We have... Uh, one of like this macrophage reaching through uh, an epithelial um, barrier and picking up a bacteria, and the caption is yoink, and just or, <laughs> or like a macrophage <laughs> eating something, and the caption is nom 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 nom. Like, nom 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 nom. Yeah. <laughs> you can learn so much science from LOL cats. We should we should do LOL biology or LOL science or Absolutely. something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, more of those. I, I'm actually sort of uh, if I, if I knew more about how the, the um, video function worked on my laptop, um, I totally add a little caption at the bottom of my face right now. But um, maybe maybe the good people of blogging heads can do that um, after the fact for us. Oh, actually, feel free I had to just some friends caption me that right took now. screenshots of my last blogging heads because you know when you're talking, you can always freeze frame it, and someone's oh, yeah, got yeah. a really lo- weird look on their face. <laughs> yeah, I had some friends make, <laughs> make me some LOL Abbeys that were hysterical, but I'm not sharing them. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, well, this is my open invitation now to anyone reading this. Send LOLs my way. Um, I probably won't put them up, but I'll have a good giggle. Um, the guys at Denialism Blog, I guess maybe a year yeah. ago, had a uh, LOL creationist uh contest and people submitted a whole bunch of lol dimskis and lol behees and you should search for those they're really good yeah i will do uh right well so what um what made you start blogging in the first place i think that's always quite an interesting question yeah um mine was sheer i felt completely isolated um honestly i had recently moved to oklahoma and i didn't have a lot of friends i didn't have like when I was in uh, Nebraska for a while, I was involved with uh, Nebraskans for Excellence in Science Education, and I felt yeah. like I had my own like scientific community where I could talk about cool new physics um, findings or cool new biology findings. And then I came here to Oklahoma, and I didn't have anything like that. And mm. you know, I'd be reading these really cool papers, and I had absolutely no one to go. Oh my God, this is so cool! Um, too. Mm. So I just started writing a blog on Blogger and got like two hits a month and uh, just kept at it for a while. And uh, eventually um, I was interviewed with uh, Reggie, the infidel guy. Um, I mm-hmm. <laughs> I debated an HIV denier named uh, 
Lenny Horowitz. And right. uh, PZ picked up on that, and uh, I got feringulated, and, uh, <laughs> and now I am where I am today. Excellent. But what about you? Uh, I... I think I started this because, um, so at my job I do a fair amount of writing, but, um, it, I mean, it, it's, it tends to be quite, um, quite, quite simple in terms of style because you're trying to reach up as broad an audience as possible, um, so you want to keep things fairly straightforward. Now, my sort of default mode of writing is in, uh, slightly more florid prose, I guess. So um, I, I basically wanted an avenue to be able to write stuff that was in a style that I was most natural. Not so sterilized. No, yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, being able to put a, put a bit more character in it. Um, and uh, since then, it's really become about the fact that I really enjoy learning about new paper. So you know, at any point on my desktop, I've got about six or seven PDFs that I really, really want to cover and probably won't have time to. Um, but uh, the blog just sort of very, very gradually built up a readership over time. Um, it was on WordPress originally. joined science blogs um, in uh, f- about less than a year ago, so I think February of this year. And um, the, the thing I really enjoyed about that is that... Um, uh, the commenters have been uh, a lot more interesting. So you've you've uh, got a lot more comments um, on posts and people sort of refuting other people oh, yeah. in in a way that I used to have to do, um, but but can now sort of sit back and you know eat popcorn and watch the drama unfold. And you know that's a really satisfying thing for me is when uh, say I write a post about HIV and someone mm. comes in with a question. And then someone else can answer them in the comments yeah. just because they read a post I'd written maybe six months ago. And they they read it, they remembered it, they understand it um, and could answer someone else's question about it. That makes me feel yeah. so good. I know. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Well, one, one thing which I... Which I'm quite surprised doesn't happen more is, is that so I, I write I summarize people's pe- people's research mm-hmm. and um, and, and as I said a lot of them sometimes come back to me and say well done that was quite good but only once has anyone any scientist actually responded to queries about their work that were raised in the comments in more comments and I think yeah. that's exactly what you said yeah. earlier that that there's just this sort of ignorance about how the the format works. Um, and you know, usually when I get sort of when I get praise from scientists, it's usually through an email, um, and and then I have to sort of write back meekly and go, "Do you mind sticking that in the comments? Because yeah. it make me feel good and look good." Um, and and you know, that, that's what I'd wish would really happen. I think. Um, and people get excited when they can have their questions answered like right from the horse's mouth, um, because yeah, I, yeah. I know when uh, Panda's Thumb we were discussing. Uh, a paper on bacterial evolution and the author came in and started answering people's questions and it was awesome all of a sudden there were like 500 more comments because people wanted to ask this guy questions yeah it was great and i think and I think it really speaks to the fact that the the public are actually really interested in this and oh, want yeah. to, um, sort of more direct contact with the people who are involved in it um and like one of the things that um that I think is good about blogging is that you, you sort of reduce the degrees of separation between scientist mm-hmm. and listener. Um, so like in, in, in our case, it's just one step. So we're sort of, you know, acting as a mouthpiece and, and translating this stuff for, for other people. Um, and if you compare that to the mainstream media, you've got um, scientists, ju- um, press release, uh, press officer, journalist, editor, sub-editor, and it, there's so many stages that it's it's no wonder that errors creep in, yes. and you know it's like the thing where you, if you make a copy of a copy of a copy, it's always it always has a fallen quality. Um, I still I, just, I still make mistakes though. I totally make mistakes. There's yeah. one a huge one I made. Uh, oh yeah. Pretty recently was that um, someone asked me uh, how we named endogenous retroviruses because we always hear about. Um, Herb human endogenous retrovirus K or Herb H. Mm-hmm. And 
I, for some reason, I was under the impression that these were named just in alphabetical order. That All right, that's yeah. just, I, for some reason, that's what I thought. And then uh, I was reading a paper one day, and I realized that's not the case. Um, they're named after, uh, so the process of reverse transcription, um, it needs a primer, just like uh, you yep. need a primer for any sort of transcription. And uh, it uses a tRNA. Um, and different yeah. viruses use different tRNAs. And so a herb K uses a lysine because the, yep. the abbreviation for lysine is K. The thought never occurred to me. And so, oh, yeah, they just named them <laughs> alphabetically. And then, oh, I, I just felt so dumb. And I had answered someone's question. <laughs> oh, yeah, they just named them alphabetically. And when there's a really, there's a cooler answer behind it than that, oh, I felt terrible. <laughs> But but you know that that's great though because you you know you learn stuff and you get your perceptions challenged yeah. um, and like I I think I um someone pointed out a typo in a post I did recently and I said oh yeah you know I I really appreciate stuff like this um, you know pe- pedants of the internet please feel free to write in which was a mistake because there are you know because then I had then there were quite a few comments saying. Um, misspelling here this word used wrongly uh, oh yeah uh, um, i get that regularly um and at least like three emails a week about my refusal to use apostrophes so um, <laughs> yeah like, your one woman campaign I to am. bring they're, down the apostrophe they're, yeah, they're pointless in my text messaging world um <laughs> <laughs> it's my one woman campaign against them yeah uh, but awesome. I'm completely un- unapologetic about it. And like I said, I'm not a writer, and I don't take myself seriously as such. So I think I'm allowed to do my, have my own little writing quirks. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. And and it, and and again, I think this is one of the uh, this is one of the strengths about blogging because it allows people who you know w- wouldn't necessarily get through um, be able to write for mainstream media oh, yeah. to really have their Discover voice. Discover is not you, going to be the... calling me up anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and like from my point of view, it's um, I think it was great having this sort of portfolio of stuff ready made. So um, when when I do like write pictures to people, I can then say, um, you know, I, I'm not just some random person asking you for this. I, I am actually a fairly decent writer. See above for, you know, yeah, for examples yeah. of this. Well, and I don't know. I, I'd really like it if uh, bloggers were taken more seriously. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the completely non-serious blogger, but um, there's so many times where I learn things from blogs that maybe mainstream media didn't cover at all um, and, or, you know, were kind of looked down upon by mainstream media when I think Again, I think we're doing a better job of uh, communicating certain kinds of information. Um, Mm. And I think that since we're with Seed, that maybe we can get, like, official media uh, passes or press passes or something like that. But, Mm. you know, I really really like the idea of uh, citizens, journalists, where, you know, anybody can open up a blogger account and anybody um, can be a journalist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think there are some aspects of journalism which are worth learning about. Um, like I think the things that I took away from the course I did were that um, the sort of way you write essays when you're a student or when when you know when you're at school doesn't quite work for journalism because um, they're sort of a bit too. With, with like with a with a piece of proper journalism, you what you basically put all your big stuff at the top. So you've got um, you know your conclusions and you, um, you, you've got something to hook people in. Yeah. Where as opposed to um, a sort of traditional essay structure, where you've got this sort of long introduction and methods and then results, or you know the way a science paper is yeah. written. Um, and and I think that sometimes seems a bit obvious if you've been doing it for a while, but I don't think it is when you start off doing it. And I think stuff like that, um, 
are stuff you know things like that are worth learning about um and i think there are organizations that are really trying to get um scientists a bit more involved in journalism and trying to, to you know get get a bit more experience in that field i think that can only really be a good thing well and a lot um, more science magazines i've seen are picking up bloggers as like side writer projects it's not just seed anymore um discover yeah. is picking up writers nature is picking up writers um and of course wired has writers uh, but I think I don't know. I think they're they're realizing uh, the advantages to having bloggers as the writers. Mm hmm. So um, I wanted to ask you about um, th- about HIV research. Okay. Um, there was a, a paper which came out in Nature, I think, a couple of weekends ago, which was um, looking at um, a vaccine that was tried out in. Um, monkeys. Okay. Did you see that? Um, probably not yet. Um, vaccine stuff is towards the end of the line uh, yeah. of the continuum, and I'm really at the very, very beginning of that line, just looking at the way the virus evolves uh, over time and how best to design vaccines to HIV. Mm. Um, but are you talking about one uh, to initiate... Um, a cytotoxic T cell response. Yes. Okay. So I think the idea was that um, I think that the angle that was that was in the paper was that the um, I think research on this has been really difficult in humans, oh, yeah. but um, the, but the, the paper provides a proof of principle that because um, it's workable in monkeys, that um, that it's not a route that's worth that's oh, yeah. you know oh, ready to be abandoned yet. Like I was saying, I'm I'm totally Debbie Downer on uh, a lot of the HIV research that gets pushed by the media. But um, just to be completely clear, it's like it's not hopeless. Um, so with mm-hmm. HIV vaccines, there are two different targets. You can either try to uh, stimulate the B cell response to get antibodies. And those uh, antibodies can stick to the virus and prevent it from infecting new cells. Or you can initiate a a cytotoxic T-cell response. And that generates these T-cells that kill infected cells. Um, And we know either one of these targets could work. We know, like, we've tried this in primates. And uh, the problem is sometimes these vaccines work in adults and then they kill babies, um, infant primates we give these vaccines to. Uh, You know, we just had all these trials in humans where um, the group that got the vaccine, not statistically sound, but more of the individuals who got the vaccine ended up getting HIV. Um, And so that gets really depressing, but we we can do it. Um, The problem is, is looking for the gold standard looking for something Mm -hmm. like a polio vaccine where, um, like you don't, you don't get the infection, everything's fine. Um, nothing's wrong because the problem with HIV is once it, once it gets a foothold in the door, once it starts infecting cells, it's a retrovirus. So it's in those cells forever. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. so what we need to do is not look so much for a vaccine that completely like sterilizes the infection. Um, yeah. my point of view is that why don't we just vaccinate against the viruses that are the most deadly? Um, so you could be infected with HIV, but if you have this vaccine and it prevents the evolution of the more aggressive kinds of HIV, then maybe you can live for 30 years without drugs. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you'd still have HIV for the rest of your life, but it might not kill you. Um, yeah. so I think, uh, a problem looking at it from just a normal person's perspective. Well, if it's if it doesn't prevent the infection, then what good is the vaccine? But from a practical perspective, it's something. It's something that's helpful, and it's not a drug yeah, so you have to take five times a day. It's not an expensive drug that you can't pay for, but it's something, and we can do it. So the approach is to keep the virus at bay yes. rather than to eradicate it completely. Yes. Um, so it turns out that uh, the more quickly you progress to AIDS is uh, associated with how fit um, the virus is that you're infected with. So if you have someone who's progressing very quickly to AIDS and someone who's progressing slowly, um, 
the one in the fast progressor is uh, more fit, it's more aggressive, it will infect more cells than the one yeah. from the slow progressor. So the trick yeah. is figuring out the genetic characteristics of the more aggressive strain. Vaccinate against him. If he can't evolve and the only one you're left with is the left, less aggressive strain, at this point, that's good enough for me. Um, it's a therapy. It's It could help millions of people. That's what I'm going for. Yeah. Uh, is there any risk then that the slow um, slow, slow aggressor will then convert into the fast version? Um, if you, It depends on how you design the vaccine. Talk to me in, oh, 20 years and, <laughs> and see where I'm at. <laughs> uh, but the problem. Excellent. We'll do an, we'll do a sequel. Yeah. Blogging heads <laughs> in twenty that years. How's that HIV research older. going for you? <laughs> yeah. Um, but the problem is with HIV is that it always figures out a way. Um, yeah. But if we can help enough people, that will buy us some time, um, because it's not go- it's not going to evolve resistance overnight. Um, just buy us some time till you know we can get a new technology, a new idea. Uh, that can that can be what we want it to be, and that's an ultimate cure. Hmm. Uh, do you is that sort of aspect interest uh, like does does that aspect of things that are, that you know your work can actually go on to help save lives? Is that a motivating thing for you? Is that why you went into this area? Um, I went into this area because I like viruses, and I'm yeah. obsessed with them. Talk about them all the time online and in real life, and uh, but knowing that you can help it's not oh i'm gonna cure aids it's that i'm gonna do something that helps somebody else cure aids maybe 50 years from now that that i'm contributing in a positive way absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah and um i mean it's sort of it's a very similar thing with with cancer research and um knowing that you're providing information that um that could help people make choices that may save the lives in the future. I think that's a really oh, yeah. powerful thing. Well, and, you know, inspiring the kids that are stuck in Oklahoma and think that there's no <laughs> way that they can go on to be an AIDS researcher. Well, you know, that's what I do. Um, inspiring that kid who's maybe in fifth grade right now that could be my grad student in 15 years. Mm. Um, yeah, it's looking at it from the long term and not the short term. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I think we're coming up uh, towards the end of our uh, mm. dialogue. There's one more thing I have to bring up. Yeah, go okay. on. Okay, it's the Vampires Man. Are you? You're into <laughs> Vampires too, right? Like you're a Buffy fan, right? I'm totally a okay. Buffy fan. So, because Buffy, right, turned up at exactly the right point of time in my life because I, because I think when she went, when she graduated from high school, I graduated from high school, and she went to college, I went to college, so. Um, it was, you know, it, there's some, there's really something about creating something that your that your viewing audience is exactly the same age yeah. as your main character. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I started out when I was real little on the Anne Rice books. I loved those, and then Buffy came along, and loved those, and now there's the Twilight books that girls are going nuts over because, like you said, the the main character is the same age as all these girls. And, uh, you know, she has her first boyfriend who just happens to be a vampire. And, oh, these girls are just having their first boyfriends, too. They're going absolutely nuts over it. Um, but I just I just had to put out a public service announcement for these girls that, you know, Edward isn't the only vampire out there who's awesome. It's like there's, there's this other guy named Angel who's pretty cool, and you might want to check out Buffy. <laughs> Yeah, because a lot of these yes. girls are getting in trouble with their parents for being so obsessed over these books, and uh, really? like it will be all they read, and then it, the series is gone, and oh, they're so distraught. And I'm like, no, it's like you can watch the first two seasons of Buffy online for free at Hulu. It's like, I uh, yeah, I know it. There's there's really nothing more distressing than seeing people be really geeky, but in the wrong way. And about the wrong <laughs> things, like yeah, please, please be a geek, because yes. because we are, yes. and we we want more of you. But be, but, a, but be a joss uh, yeah. like we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's here's a sort of geek reading list for yes. you of good stuff that you know that you should probably take into account before you go too far down this road. And then I just started watching uh, the series on HBO 
called True Blood. Um, it's a different... Oh, I don't think I know about Oh, that. dude, you have to get caught up on these, because <laughs> it came out before Twilight, and there are a lot right. of plot similarities, but it, it's very different. It's more of a, like a murder mystery sort of thing. Um, and so these follow uh, the adventures of this girl named Sookie, um, who is, of course, in love with a vampire um, and a shapeshifter. And uh, they've got an HBO series out um, for these books now. And I think it's really good, but I haven't gotten to read the books yet. Uh, but, mm. yeah, so the vampires, they're so hot right now. It's like Hansel. Excellent. Actually, now, you might not have seen this, but um, the best vampire um, sci-fi thing I've ever seen has been a short British series called Ultraviolet. Ever seen Ultraviolet? No. We have, like, the okay. movie... That, no, okay. no, it's nothing to do with okay. that. So, so it's it's vampires, but done in a really British way. So awesome. it's kind of downplayed and very subtle, and they never actually mention the word vampires. And it's got um, it's got it's got Jack Davenport in it, who is another British. He was the um, you probably most likely know him as um, Captain Norrington in Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay. Okay. Um, but he's been lots of different stuff. He's been in a sitcom called Coupling, which is also awesome. But okay. he's the he's the lead guy in Ultraviolet. And there's lots of like quite classical English theatre actors um, playing all the lead parts. Uh, nice. It's absolutely superb. And there's only like there's only six episodes, so it never gets around to jumping the shark. It just has a very tight, short plot line, which BBC just gets completely resolved. TV that shows time. do that. Um, so, oh, which is the one I really like? Uh, Spaced with Simon Pegg, and there's just a few mm, episodes, and then yeah. you never see it ever again. I know, <laughs> yeah, the space is awesome. Space sort of defined my uh, like early 20s. But then you, you get like 12 episodes, and then you never get to see it again. BBC's got to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you see, we, we like that, because it never gets around to the point where, um, where things stop being funny. The characters never hide and, in a refrigerator to get get away from a nuclear bomb. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or talk talk to little little gophers. What what was up with that? Yeah. Or or have or you know never meet aliens. But but um. <laughs> oh, Crab people. What I was say now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad people. Bad, bad, bad. Um, it was something about spaced. No, I've totally lost my train of thought now. Um. Sam and Peg in the Star Trek oh. movies. No, okay. no, it wasn't that. Um, oh yeah, so um, the BBC. Uh, the other thing I particularly love about um, about British television are the natural uh, the natural history programs that we put out. Oh yeah. Um, so just just absolutely world class um, wildlife programs, and and that is something that I absolutely love about being here because it's just so. Like everyone loves it, they're always um, they're always incredibly popular, and it's sort of very very ingrained into British culture. This you know sort of fascination with wildlife, and my absolute highlight of this year was um, in January getting to interview David Attenborough. I heard about that um, in his home. Oh, How awesome was that? Yeah. Okay. So there's something to be said for being a real writer and a real journalist. You get to interview people like David Attenborough. <laughs> yeah, I know. He I, and he was absolutely amazing. Like really, really down to earth. Very nice guy. Um, you know. And and I'm sitting on his sofa, looking at his fossil collection, talking about stuff. Awesome. I know. It was really good. So so yeah. There there is some value in. Um, in, in going down the traditional route. Okay. Well, you got me there, and uh, it's been really great to talk to you. Yeah, it's been really, really good to talk to you too.